silent sermon. He picked up the flower and gazed upon it. There were many monks with him. Many monks that were there in the sermon. But of all those monks, there was only one who smiled. After a while, the monk smiled. It was said that he was the only monk that understood the meaning of that sermon. And legend has it that that smile was passed down to 28 consecutive masters. And it ultimately became Gazing at the beauty of a flower was likely the first time that humanity began to awaken. That humankind began to awaken to the beauty that we are, our true nature. In the evolution of life on this planet, the earliest plant life was a vast sea of green leafy vegetation. There wasn't much variation in color. A lot of green. Pretty green, but pretty much green. And then one day, one day, one human being saw a tiny speck of a new color. And that human being might have thought that they were hallucinating because it was just one speck and it didn't remain long. Possibly the next day when they went down the same path, that speck of color, that first flower, was no longer there. But after eons, many eons more, flowers began to appear with greater abundance. They would appear and after a time disappear and reappear. Yeah, they were perennials. I don't, did they have any annuals back then? I don't think so. I love perennials. Some of you know I love perennials. They're so easy. They keep coming back. See, for the first time, you and I, those earliest humans, had something of beauty in their lives, something that they treasured, that they valued, that had no utilitarian purpose. And seeing the beauty in that flower stimulated new questions, questions that were never before asked. What is beauty? Where does it come from? What does it mean? from that first flower. Now this understanding of the role of flowers and the evolution of our spiritual awakening, I didn't originate. I encountered this in a book called The New Earth, written by Eric Tolle. Does anybody know, does he pronounce it Tolle or Tolle? Tolle, I thought it was Tolle, like Tolle. <laughs> I'm glad he says Tole. It's much better than Tole. It reminds me of a boot. So, <laughs> this understanding I first found in his book. The purpose of every spiritual path, of every faith tradition, is to awaken. Every true faith tradition has this as their one mission. In Hinduism, it's
it's called enlightenment. In Christianity, salvation. In Buddhism, it's called the end of suffering. The end of suffering. In new thought, new thought movement and unity, to awaken is to see beauty, to see goodness in everything, always. That's what in new thought to awaken means. And you know that the Buddha means the awakened one. I love that, the awakened one. Do you know how he ended his suffering? He began to see beauty in everything and everywhere. He stopped becoming reactive and a victim to the outer world of form. And he woke up. Just as you and I are waking up here and now. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night, panicked? You kind of looked around, you know, got your bearings, and oh, okay, all right, I'm, it's in my bed, I'm in my bed, from, because it was a really, really scary dream. Or maybe, maybe, you woke up after, and you were, you woke up, you looked around, and, darn it. It was only a dream. Because it was a really, really, really good dream. <laughs> and you want it to be real. Now the reason that you are either worried or pleasantly chagrined is that you believed what you were thinking as you were dreaming. You believed that. And therein lies Humanities, meaning your and my greatest dysfunction, our single greatest dysfunction. And mind you, I don't say things categorically very often. And I see lots of shades of gray in life, but I am saying this categorically. Our single greatest dysfunction is that we believe what we think. We believe what we think is true and real. I want to share with you, just uh, this a little bit on the light side, a few things that some of our greatest thinkers thought were true and real. I have 10 of them. Number 10, computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. <laughs> that was from Popular Mechanics, 1949. Number nine, in 1939, the New York Times said the problem of TV was that people had to glue their eyes to a screen and that the average American wouldn't have time for it. Eight, an English astronomy professor said in the early 19th century that air travel at high speed would be impossible because passengers would suffocate. Theoretically, Television may be feasible, but I consider it an impossibility, a development which we should waste little time dreaming about. Lee DeForest, 1926, the inventor of the cathode ray tube. <laughs> Television is impossible. With over 50 foreign cars already on sale here, the Japanese auto industry isn't likely to carve out a big slice of the U.S. market. Business week, 1958. I think there was a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, 1943, chairman of IBM. <laughs> Where'd you go, Tom? <laughs> Weren't you right? Number four, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union, inter Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. We don't need you. You haven't got through college yet. Hewlett Packard's rejection of Steve Jobs, who went on to found Apple Computers. 
Number two, airplanes are interesting toys, but they have no military value. Marshall Bernard Polk, 1911. And this is my favorite, number one. Now, we got to set the context for this, because not everybody here is technically about, uh, I wish I were here, about, uh, tell me, what was the average megabyte that you have now, megabyte, in your computer zone, four? Gigabyte. It's gigabyte, thank you, it's gigabyte, like four gigabytes. It's terabyte now. Oh, it's and some, some, yeah, and now it's tera, terabytes, all right? Okay, this is, this is Bill Gates. 640K ought to be enough for anybody. <laughs> Bill Gates, 1981. Well, we, I got that this week, and it's like, this is just perfect. <coughs> we think what we think is true. What we think, you know, we, we, we think that what we're dreaming is not true because we're dreaming. I submit to you that what we think when we're awake is no more true than when we are dreaming. Now that is tough for me to get my mind around. And I'm getting a much better understanding of why it's difficult for me to get my mind around it. And hopefully we will all have a better understanding of that by the time this message concludes today. But what I think, not so much. And every major faith tradition has a name for this. In Hinduism, they call it Maya. Maya means delusion. The delusion that the world of form is reality. There was a great Indian mystic named Dramana Maharshi, and he said this very plainly. He said, the mind is maya. And what he meant was, what we think is an illusion. Our thoughts that the world of form is reality is a delusion. We are he didn't say just an illusion, he said delusion, because who, who's doing what? We are deluding ourselves. We are deluding ourselves. The Buddhists have their term for it, it's called dukkha. Dukkha translates as suffering, or being unsatisfied, or miserable. And the Buddha said, Wherever you go, whatever you do, sooner or later, you're going to bump up against dukkha. Christianity. Christianity has a term for, for this as well, although it's really, really, really been misunderstood and mistranslated. It's original sin. Sin comes from an, it's an ancient, ancient, ancient archery term. And it was S-Y-N, if you were to translate it into English. And if an archer took aim at a target and missed, they sinned, meaning they missed the mark. They missed the mark. When Jesus used it, when Jesus said, you are sinning, what he was saying is, you are missing the mark. You are missing the point of the very purpose of our human existence. 